Mother Nature forces President Trump to cancel a heartland rally while his co closest rival in the GOP presidential polling barnstorms the same state. Good evening, I'm John Scott, and this is the Fox Report. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis in Iowa today picking up some key local endorsements, even though he has not declared himself a 2024 presidential candidate. Meanwhile, former President Donald Trump has had to cancel a rally in the same state because of bad weather. He was expected to trot out his own endorsements during that event. Alexis McAdams is live in Sioux City, Iowa for us. Alexis. John, good evening from Iowa. This is where we did expect to see former President Donald Trump headline what they said was going to be a big rally that was sold out with thousands of people. That's no longer the case, but we did catch up with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. I had a chance to talk to him about what he says is a mess right now from the White House, specifically at our southern border. Watch. Anything you want to say about the southern border and kind of what you're seeing out there? I know you addressed it just a few minutes ago. It's a disaster, and it's um, a man-made disaster with bad policies. And so you obviously are going to continue to have bad, bad things happen because they're not going to change uh, the policy. But uh, it should be shut. The border should just be shut down. I mean, that's what you do. You know, if we were in, if this were like World War II era, they would have shut that down in 48 hours. Our country does not get things done anymore, and that's something that we're going to need to change. Governor DeSantis was in town, John, talking to hundreds of supporters, discussing everything from border security to strengthening our military and the importance of education, saying that governing is not about entertaining, not about building a brand or talking on social media or virtue signaling, but says it's about winning and producing results. This is just a glimpse into what we might see and what could be in store for 2024 as DeSantis and Trump lead in the early polls. Endorsements are rolling in for both of the men. Congressman Randy Feenstra, who organized that event today with DeSantis, wouldn't say who he's backing, but told me he's behind whoever can beat President Biden. I'm not for my sport behind anybody. I, I'm just, I want to be an ambassador to everybody. I want to show everybody what Iowa has to offer. I mean, we have so many great things. Our economy is growing. We have a great and wonderful leader in uh, Governor Reynolds. Uh, I just hope everybody can come and anybody that can beat uh, President Biden, I'm all behind. But Iowa was back in the political spotlight today as people who lived here were preparing for both of those big events. Although Trump's event was canceled due to weather, John, he did release a long list of new endorsements. In that list, it says they've had more than 150 local officials across the state of Iowa who want to see the president, former president, reelected. And Governor DeSantis has been endorsed by more than three dozen GOP legislators just from Iowa. John. And Governor DeSantis sure acts and talks like a presidential candidate. He just hasn't made an announcement yet. That's right. Alexis McAdams. Alexis, thanks. The migrant surge at the southern border expected to reach new heights now that Title 42, the pandemic-era asylum restrictions, have officially expired. We have Fox team coverage with Lucas Tomlinson at the White House on the Biden administration's reaction. First, though, a live look at Brownsville, Texas. That's where Bill Malusian has the latest on the border crisis there. Bill? Well, John, yesterday, White House Press Secretary Corrine Jean-Pierre made the claim that mass releases of migrants are not happening here at the southern border. That is absolutely false. They are happening. They have been happening. We will show them to you. Take a look at this video we shot right here in Brownsville yesterday. Large numbers of migrants who had just been mass released from federal custody wandering around city streets here next to a bus depot, also next to an NGO. You'll see some of them walking around with folders with their DHS paperwork. That NGO helps arrange their travel for them. It's predominantly Venezuelan migrants who have been released here. We caught up with one of them. Here's what he had to say. I'm elated and extremely excited. I was released this morning. I doubted myself if I was going to be allowed in, but I've made it. Now, earlier in this week here in Brownsville, we were seeing some remarkable images like this, mass illegal crossings coming into the city, but we started seeing 
the Texas National Guard and Texas DPS troopers physically blocking and repelling people from crossing illegally. Rows and rows of razor wire set up with soldiers and troopers who were not letting these migrants in after they crossed illegally. That was a switch up from their previous strategy, which was they would hand them off to Border Patrol. This week, uh, the state of Texas said no. And instead, the federal government, they want to mass release some of these migrants with future court dates. Here's what a former federal prosecutor at the border had to say about those court dates. They spent thousands of dollars, traveled for days, weeks, sometimes even months. I don't expect many of them, if any, to actually show up at ICE or appear for their immigration court dates. And then take a look at these images after midnight, minutes after midnight on Friday, when Title 42 finally expired. We were on the banks of the Rio Grande here uh, in Matamoros, Mexico. There were groups of migrants materializing. It looked like they were going to cross, but across the river, you'll see Texas once again was repelling them. Barbed wire, soldiers, they were on the megaphones warning people do not cross. One guy eventually tried jumping in the water to cross, but it essentially turned off in, into a bit of a standoff between Texas and these migrants migrants in the immediate minutes after Title 42, and we have not seen a whole lot of major illegal crossings here the last couple of days ever since Texas showed up. But John, the numbers from this week, historic. This week alone, Border Patrol says at least 83,000 people crossed our border illegally. That's enough to fill up Dallas Cowboys football stadium in a single week. Stunning numbers, John. We'll send yeah, it back to you. Absolutely. Absolutely stunning. Bill Malusian, live in Brownsville, Texas. Bill, thanks. President Biden spending the weekend in Delaware where he's dealing with the fallout over the end of those Title 42 restrictions and the White House reacting to a federal judge blocking an administration policy to release migrants into the U.S. on parole without a court date. Lucas Tomlinson is live at the White House with more on that. Lucas? John, the Justice Department is seeking to overturn that judge's ruling because they say the Border Patrol says the detention centers are being overwhelmed and they have no choice but to release those migrants into the country without a court date. Now, President Biden speaking at Howard University's graduation ceremony here in the nation's capital, the Cap One Arena, he did not discuss the southern border, but he did give the following warning. The most dangerous terrorist threat to our homeland is white supremacy. I'm not saying this because I'm at a black HBCU. I say it wherever I go. Now, expected Republican presidential candidate Tim Scott reacting on Twitter. Joe Biden is weaponizing race again to hide his failures. Failures at the border, across the globe, in our schools, streets, and finances. This is the opposite of progress. Now, Joe Biden did get asked a following question about the debt ceiling earlier today. I think they're moving along. It's hard to tell. We're not going uh, to reach the crunch point yet. So, but there's real discussion about some changes. Now, at the end of Title 42 late this week, a meeting in Vienna went largely unnoticed. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan talking to his Chinese counterparts in the Austrian city with a long history of hosting diplomatic engagements during the Cold War, which is where some lawmakers believe the U.S. and China are right right now. Now, Secretary of State Blinken canceled his visit to China one day before a U.S. Air Force F-22 Raptor shot down that giant 4,000-pound Chinese spy machine off the coast of South Carolina in early February. According to officials, Sullivan relayed a message to the Chinese that President Biden wants to, quote, move beyond that incident. Now, China is expected to be a big source of conversation when President Biden travels to Japan and later to Australia beginning Wednesday. John? So all of those concerns about the spy balloon and the White House wants to move beyond it. That's right, John. That's right. Not the Chinese that want to move beyond, but the White House. Interesting. Lucas Tomlinson, live from the White House. Lucas, thanks. California Governor Gavin Newsom announcing his state has a nearly $32 billion budget deficit. That's about $10 billion more than he estimated in January. And this after a task force he established recommended billions of dollars in cash reparation payments to black residents for the after effects of slavery. Alexandria Hoff has more. 
Well, critics of Newsom have blamed the state's progressive tax code for the budget strain. It relies on wealthy taxpayers, some who have left, some who have suffered in the stock market. And now the shortfall that Governor Newsom predicted back in January turned out to be an underestimate. Yesterday, he called it a challenge. What's that add up to? Just shy, says 32. We round up 31.5 billion. So we have a $31.5 billion challenge. We are walking into a budget where we need to maintain our prudence and we need to prepare not just for the short term, but the medium and long term. With that, Newsom's latest budget proposal includes roughly $1 billion in spending reductions. That's on top of $9.6 billion announced in January. The plan is to further cinch the gap through borrowing and tapping into state reserves. Republican Assembly Leader James Gallagher said in a statement, quote, his fiscal gimmicks are short-sighted and his words about good government and efficiency are yet another empty promise. California Californians deserve better. Now, this all comes one week after California's reparations task force approved a plan that, if approved by lawmakers, would pay black residents of the state up to $1.2 million each. That's to make amends for slavery. It's a decision that could end up costing the state as much as $800 billion. Governor Newsom told Fox News Digital last week that he has not endorsed this proposal, stating, dealing with that legacy is about much more than cash payments. Now, in a follow-up with Newsweek, as spoke Person for Newsom denied that the governor is against the payments, saying that he will make up his mind after the task force submits a final report. John. Alexandria Hoff. Alex, thanks. You know, there's a term for that. It's called racketeering. We're going to uh, demand that the Biden family uh, provide invoices. If they can't do that, then obviously all eyes are on Joe Biden because why else would uh, foreign nationals be wiring money to his nieces, nephews, and, and grandchild? Major new allegations of influence peddling surrounding the president and his family revealed this week. The House Oversight Committee is ramping up its investigation into Biden family business deals. Members say they are gaining more insight through the release of the president's son Hunter's records. A criminal prosecution could be imminent, which could impact the 2024 presidential race. Let's bring in Michigan Congresswoman Lisa McLean. She's on the Committee uh, on Oversight and Accountability, House Armed Services Committee and Budget Committee. Uh, what did you learn from um, what uh, Congressman Comer released uh, as, as part of the investigation? Well, I, I think what we learned was we're just at the tip of the iceberg. You know, President Biden said and denied all of these allegations. And what we're finding is 80 visits to, to the White House from Hunter Biden's business associates, over $10 million um, from bank records, which by the way, those bank records indicated suspicious activity, but over $10 million of payments made to the Biden family and more than 20 shell companies set up. That's not a real good look. And the other problem I think this president has is he denied it. Well, you either are lying about that or you're completely out of touch with the American people, but even more so, you're completely out of touch with your nine family members that received almost or over $10 million worth of payments. So. Although we have a lot of facts and a lot of evidence, I still think there's a lot more to find out. The president last week said that uh, Hunter has done nothing wrong. He has always said that he stands behind his son and that he's very proud of him. Your, your belief is that Hunter has done something very wrong? My belief is Hunter has done something very wrong. Um, it, it, it's, it, it's sad to see uh, Joe, uh, President Biden, excuse me, uh, defend in this nature his son. I mean, it's, I, I get we're all parents. I mean, I'm a parent, I have four kids, but at the end of the day, your kids are going to continue to make mistakes unless you call them on the carpet and point out their mistakes. Clearly that hasn't happened in the Biden family. Uh, um, absolutely, Hunter Biden has done something wrong. Absolutely. And you're convinced the president was aware. How do you know that? 
Well, all you have to do is look at the bank records, 20 shell companies, 80 visits. You mean to tell me I have four children. If my children and, and one of my grandchildren, who I don't have, but one of my grandchildren received payments, I wouldn't know that. I find that very hard to believe. But again, that's why we are going to continue the investigation, because I want to make sure that we are dealing with facts and not just opinions. That's why we have sent out more subpoenas and you will have more subpoenas and uh, that you'll see over the coming weeks. My hope is that this administration um, joins us um, and will actually help in complying with the the subpoenas in which we're requesting. We've had legal expert and law professor Jonathan Turley on this program. He said, you know, unpleasant as it might be, influence peddling is not a crime in this country. Are you convinced that crimes have been committed? Well, what's the definition of racketeering? Creating um, a shell company uh, for the purpose of money laundering. That's what we want to get to the bottom of. I mean, 20 shell companies, uh, the Biden family shut up uh, 20 shell companies while your uh, father, while your uncle, while your brother, while your grandpa is vice president. Mm. That's just kind of a coincidence. And quite frankly, I'm not much for coincidences. The other question I would ask is, let's be fair. If the tables were turned and let's say this was George Santos or, God forbid, President Trump, I wonder if we would have the same opinion. So you're going to keep uh, following the money. You think there are other shoes to drop here? It always goes back to follow the money. And especially when you if you follow the money and there is no consequence to the action, then it's going to be more and more evidence that we're going to begin to see and understand. One thing I want to point out is even on the bank records, it says, even from the bank, suspicious activities. Mm. So even the banks flagged these transactions as suspicious activities. Were they investigated? What type of investigation did, uh, what did the best investigation yield? There's a lot more answers um, that, that we need to get for not only the American people, but also the Department of Justice. We'll be and watching. And that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, we'll is be bring watching. bring this to light. Watching what your committee comes up with. Michigan Congresswoman Lisa McLean, thank you. Still to come on the Fox Report, Marine veteran Daniel Penny's attorney is blasting criticism of his client and says he should be praised, not prosecuted for that deadly chokehold on Jordan Neely on a New York City subway. Defense attorney Keisha Heaven joins us on how the prosecution and defense might be prepping for a potential manslaughter trial. Keep it here. A Marine veteran Daniel Penny insists his client should be celebrated, not prosecuted. Penny was arraigned yesterday on manslaughter charges in the chokehold death of Jordan Neely on a New York City subway. Neely's family is slamming the district attorney, calling the charges too lenient. CB Cotton is live in New York City with more on that case. CB. John, good evening. Daniel Penny's attorneys are now saying we should expect more to come in this case, presumably evidence which they believe will exonerate their client. One of Penny's attorneys, Thomas Kenneth, told WABC's radio show Cats and Cosby on Friday night he thought the case was headed to a grand jury, but instead was caught off guard when the Manhattan DA's office decided to arrest and charge Penny with second degree manslaughter, a felony with a penalty of up to 15 years in prison. The DA's move came after several protests throughout the city, some escalating to violent clashes between protesters and police. The DA's office will still have to present the case to a grand jury to secure an indictment. Now, Penny surrendered Friday and was released on a hundred thousand dollar bond. Kenneth saying on the radio show this case is far from over. He said Neely's death is a tragedy, but he feels his client should be praised for protecting other New Yorkers. He was really putting himself in harm's way for the benefit of others. Mm -hmm. and he shouldn't be you know, pilloried for that. He should be celebrated. 
Neely had 42 prior arrests. His family's attorneys have pointed to Neely's mental health struggles, struggles and his mother's murder as factors. Neely was known to city social workers and reportedly on a roster of those with the most severe troubles. Prosecutors say on May 1st, Neely had been threatening other subway riders. They say that's when the Marine veteran approached Neely from behind and placed him in a chokehold. You're trained in combat. That gives you something that the average person does not have. It gives you options. It gives you the option of bear hugging, of striking, of many other things. But Daniel Penny chose, intentionally chose, a technique to use that is designed to cut off air. Penny will be back in court in July. As of Saturday evening, a fundraiser for his legal defense has a little more than a million dollars. Jordan Neely's funeral is set for this coming Friday with prominent civil rights, civil rights leader Reverend Al Sharpton set to deliver the eulogy. John. CB Cotton, live in New York City. CB, thanks. So as Jordan Neely's family and attorneys call for stronger charges against Marine veteran Daniel Penny, Let's bring in Keisha Heaven, defense attorney and former prosecutor. Are you surprised that they brought a manslaughter charge here, Keisha? Not at all. The first thing I thought when I saw the coverage of this case was that this Marine veteran had no right to use the chokehold. And do I think he intended to kill uh, this victim? I don't. But he clearly acted recklessly, so I'm not surprised at all. Well, you say he didn't have a right to. I mean, we don't know everything that took place on the subway car, and apparently some people were quite frightened of this uh, well, fellow. From what some of the witnesses said, Mr. Neely was uh, obviously irate. He was yelling. He was making comments about being hungry, thirsty, stating that he had no reason to live. That does not justify anyone, not even a law enforcement officer, to take this man's life. Mr. Penny could have used some other type of restraint in order to stop uh, the uh, Mr. Uh, Neely from being a threat, as they state, to the passengers. But he did not have to use the chokehold. He's a, a trained Marine. He knows that the chokehold is going to cut off his airway. So why did he use that? That's why he's being charged with manslaughter. Uh, there are two other people seen in the video uh, helping him out. Why are they not charged? Because they weren't the ones with their hand around Mr. Neely's neck. And, and that just actually makes the case, in my opinion, easier for the prosecutor against Mr. Penny because they're three men. They could have restrained him in some other form without killing him. They could have grabbed his arms. They could have sat on him in the chair. They could have did anything other than employ some type or, or not they. Mr. Penny could have did something else other than cutting off his airway. You heard his uh, lawyer, Tom Kniff, say that he, he should be celebrated, that he was trying to protect uh, fellow passengers on the train and that he shouldn't be facing this manslaughter charge. I, I disagree. I get that there are good Samaritans and we're thankful for good Samaritans, but this is not a case of someone being a good Samaritan. He took it too far. He acted as if this guy was a threat and he used what he probably learned as being a Marine. This was not combat. This was a mentally ill man who was yelling and screaming on the train. He could have did something less excessive to stop the threat that they felt existed. 42 prior arrests, though, and, and one active warrant out, I believe it was for an assault on an elderly woman. That's, that's what uh, Neely was charged with here. I mean, this guy was not a choir boy. And, and you're absolutely right that those were his prior charges. But Mr. Penny didn't know that. So he and again, he's not a law enforcement officer. He's a former Marines. So it's not like there's a police officer who knew this guy's history and said, OK, he's known to assault people. Let me be a little more aggressive. This is a, a, a regular passenger on the train who took it upon himself to use self-help. And the fact that this man suffered from mental illness is, in my opinion, also something that we need to look into in terms of how the system is failing mental health issues in our communities. Yeah, it's just a sad story all the way around. One man is dead and a Marine veteran facing charges. It's just not good. Absolutely, unfortunately. Ke yeah. Keisha Heaven, thanks for joining us this evening. Thanks for having me. On Monday, Judge Janine will have an exclusive interview with Daniel Penny's attorney, Steve Razor. That's set to air Monday at 5 p.m. on The Five. That's 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Coming up, the coronavirus pandemic may, might be officially over, but the impact on our classrooms 
could be felt for years to come. Why some school districts are already moving full speed ahead with four day a week schedules. We'll hear from Dr. Marty McCary, fresh from testifying before Congress about this. I'm John Scott, and this is the Fox Report. It's the bottom of the hour. If you're just joining us, here's a look at some headlines. The White House responds to a federal judge's decision to block the Biden administration from implementing a policy that would allow for the release of migrants without court dates. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre calls the move an act of, quote, sabotage. The measure was blocked Thursday night just before the Trump-era border protection policy Title 42 expired. Former President Donald Trump cancels an outdoor rally planned for this evening in Iowa. Meanwhile, a reception hosted by the Iowa Republican Party chairman is underway in Cedar Rapids. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is there as he ponders a possible 2024 presidential run. An official 2024 announcement could come any day now. And North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper vetoes a bill aimed at tightening abortion limits. Uh, the vote sets the, the veto, I should say, sets the stage for an override battle in the state assembly. Is the federal government on a collision course with default? It's all about the money. Senior congressional correspondent Chad Pergram updates us on why all of us should care and care a lot about solving the debt ceiling crisis on Capitol Hill. Next. President Biden and House Speaker McCarthy he have pushed back a meeting to discuss the debt limit from yesterday to next week. A source tells Fox News progress is being made at the staff level despite the delay. A deal is necessary before the government is expected to hit its borrowing limit in early June. Senior congressional correspondent Chad Pergram explains what it means for you and what could play out. It's easy to doze off when you hear the term debt ceiling, but the consequences of a debt ceiling collision are anything but a sleeper. You know, out of sight, out of mind. You know, like, I wouldn't know anything about it if, you know, if you didn't say anything about it. Uh, they'll figure it out. They always do. It's just a manufactured issue. However, the debt ceiling issue is very real. The government has a credit card. Congress extends the line of credit. The limit is the debt ceiling. The Treasury Department uses the credit card, but it lacks spending power if it hits the debt ceiling, and Congress doesn't extend the credit line. There's going to be a day, possibly in early June, when that checking account is in danger of running out, and there's simply not going to be enough money in it on some given day to pay all of the obligations that are due that day. That means hundreds of thousands of federal workers don't get paid, potentially the military, Benefit checks delayed. I'm a little worried about if I'm going to get my Social Security, for sure. Treasury decides what checks get cut. And since this is like a credit card and the government is over the limit, Treasury pays the interest first. It will prioritize interest and principal payments so that it's not strictly defaulting on securities, on Treasury securities, which would royal financial markets. A market meltdown could spike interest rates and wreck the economy. So if there's no progress in the debt ceiling talks, are you worried about a default? Are you worried about the markets, Mr. Speaker? I think there's a real risk that external forces, whether it's being downgraded or a market response, could make this situation worse. Rates for car loans and home mortgages could jump long term because a federal default robs the system of fiscal trust. And an important note, a default is not a government shutdown. A shutdown comes when Congress doesn't fund the government. In this case, Congress funded the government on paper, but the government is out of cash. On Capitol Hill, Chad Pergram, Fox News. Still to come on the Fox Report, the prime suspect in the 2005 disappearance of Natalie Holloway in Aruba will soon be extradited to the United States. More on that ahead. Wow, 
我我去打那金勇好不好？我去打那金勇。哎、欸，各位叔叔爆尾了，我带夜叉大招。我要我要出全魔功了，我要去打那金勇。我考虑一下，我要出什么装？你要出打野对不对，嘟嘟？是云天打野。没有没有。哦，是云天打野哦，这么有。这只等一下，这只兔子，可走好慢哦！我的天哪、啊，它跟原地跑步一样哎。云天打野后，我们考虑这只斩杀到底杀谁？没有啊，因为刚那个、啊、刚突突快来不及了。他复活干，对啊。First blood， 哎我，好晕哦。这么久，别过来，再拍一。啊，反正我的蓝都没打完了，没有蓝了。哎、欸，那我还听你啊，那个，把你死掉。两只残血，两只残血，来了来了。等一下，我们没，哦，所以我，我好。啊，我为什么我没有任何一个助攻？哎、欸，那个兔兔，兔兔，哎、欸，蓝给你耶，我打红。没有，不用，不用，不用，不用。哎、欸，我要清下兵呢、啊。好、啊，你你要清下兵。对啊。要清下兵，那那我就打野就好了。不行呢、啊。随便，不重要。啊，不然没有，我吃我吃蓝区啊。你吃蓝区，我吃红区啊。蓝区。啊，为什么这边都那么多人呢、啊？来踢你了，我来踢你了。可以绑他吗？可以绑他吗？但绑他是没什么问题的、啊。